Hi, this is Dr. Ben Finio with Science Buddies, and in this video I'll show you how to build a simple steerable robot with a wired remote. First, let's go over all the parts you'll need to build your robot, starting with the circuit. You can find information about where to get all of these parts in the description of this video. You will need two motors with compatible wheels, two mini breadboards, a battery holder with two AA batteries, two push buttons, some electrical tape, and two different types of wire. Solid core wire, which can be pushed into the breadboards because it is more rigid, and stranded wire, which is more flexible and will be used to connect your remote to the robot. You will also need a pair of wire strippers. Note that if you have access to a soldering iron and would like to make your circuit more permanent, you can use proto board, also called perf board, shown here, which allows you to permanently solder the electronic components to it instead of using the breadboard connections, which are removable. To build the body of your robot, you can get creative and use a variety of craft supplies. I'm going to show a very simple build in this video that uses a small piece of corrugated cardboard and a toilet paper or paper towel tube, but you can build it with other parts as well, like wooden craft sticks or even building toys like Legos or Kinex. You'll want tools like scissors and a glue gun, and since these colors are a little bland, you might also want some colorful decorations to liven things up a bit. Now, let's talk a bit about how your robot's circuit will work. You can see that my remote has two buttons, and each button controls one of the motors. Pushing one button at a time allows the robot to turn, and pushing both buttons at the same time makes both wheels spin so the robot can drive straight. Let's demonstrate how this works with a single motor. To make the motor spin, we need to connect both of the motor wires to both of the battery packs wires to give us a closed circuit so electrical current can flow. We're going to make those connections using a breadboard, which has a grid of little holes that allow us to push wires into them. Each set of five holes in a row in this breadboard is connected to each other internally, so if you put two wires next to each other in a row, they'll be connected and complete the circuit. The holes are not connected across this gap in the middle of the breadboard, and they're not connected between adjacent rows. So, for example, to connect the motor to the battery pack, I'm going to put the battery pack wires in two different rows here, and I am then going to connect the motor wires, one in each row, the same as the battery pack wires. So I'm going to put the two red wires in the same row there, and then going to put the black wire in the same row as the black battery pack wire. And you can see in here that the motor starts spinning because I have a closed circuit. However, there's no way to easily turn the motor on and off without removing a wire. That is where the button comes in. You can see the button has four metal pins on the bottom. That is actually to give it some physical stability so it doesn't tip side to side when you press on it. It has one leg kind of in each corner. So we are going to add the button so one of those legs or pins is in the same row as our battery pack's black wire. And then we're going to take our motor wire and instead of putting it in the same row as the battery pack wire now, we're going to put it in the same row as the other leg or pin of the button. That's going to go right there. And if you can't see this that well in this video, you can check out the link to the written description, sorry, the written instructions in the description of the video, which will give you a wiring diagram that you can follow. Now we have the button and the breadboard there, and when I push and hold the button down, the motor will spin. So, for our robot, we're going to make this circuit, but you're going to do it twice, once for each motor, and we're going to use some longer wires to separate the motor and the battery, from a little breadboard that will act as your remote with the buttons on it. So let's prepare the two breadboards. I'm going to take my battery pack and one of the breadboards, and as I did previously, I'm going to put the red wire in one row and the black wire in a different row. I'm then going to take my motors, and I'm only going to connect one of each motor's wires to the battery. They're not both going to get connected to the battery because we need those connections to the buttons. So I'm going to connect both motors black wires to the same row as the bread as the battery packs black wire but I'm not going to connect the red wires yet next I'm going to take my other breadboard and I'm going to put my two buttons in this breadboard in different rows and again this is going to form the physical remote that you will hold with your hands 
some of my pins are a little bent there. You might have to be careful. If you bend these accidentally, they might not fit in the breadboard perfectly. This is going to form the physical remote that you'll hold with your hands to steer the robot. Now we are going to connect this breadboard to this breadboard using a very long piece of stranded wire which is flexible and will allow you to steer your robot around as you hold the remote. So you can cut a long piece of wire at least a few feet long using your wire strippers and then you are going to want to use your wire strippers to strip a bit of insulation maybe about a centimeter off the end of that wire. So clamp onto the wire, pull gently, wiggle it a little bit and the insulation should come off. Now we have a bit of a problem because again this wire is made up of a bunch of individual tiny strands that are very flexible and do not push into the breadboard that easily. So to make the connection to the breadboard sometimes you can twist these together and then they will be rigid enough to go into the breadboard but that is not always reliable. You see I tried that there and it just wound up, wound up bending. So it is much easier to make the connection if you take a piece of solid core wire, which again is much more rigid, and connect these to each other. So what I'm going to do here is strip a little bit off the end of that solid core, core wire. I'm going to bend the end of each piece of wire into a little hook shape. I'm going to hook those together. I'm going to twist them and then use the end of my wire strippers to crimp them together. So that should give me a good electrical connection. Now if you do have a soldering iron available, you can get a much better and more permanent connection using a soldering iron, but we know most of our viewers probably don't have a soldering iron at home or at school, so we're showing you an alternative way to make this connection. So once I've done that, these two wires are now connected. I can strip the insulation off the end of this wire, and then you see that that rigid part of the solid core wire will go into the breadboard much more easily. The only remaining thing you'll need to do here is cover this exposed bit of wire up with some electrical tape because if that exposed metal bumps into exposed metal on another piece of wire somewhere then that will cause a short circuit and prevent your robot from working and potentially overheat your battery. So here I have wrapped electrical tape around that connection and I have repeated that process on the other side to connect another solid core piece of wire and connect it with electrical tape. I'm now going to connect this wire to my breadboard. I'm going to put one end in the same row as the battery packs red or positive wire and I'm going to put the other end in the same row as one of the inner pins on my two buttons. So if I look at the controller like this, like I'm going to be holding it, I have the inner pins that are closer to each other and the outer pins. I'm going to put this there on one of those inner pins. Be careful not to knock your button out. And I also cut a shorter piece of jumper wire that I'm going to use to connect it to the other button. So this allows us to ultimately just have three wires connected to our remote instead of four. The two motors are going to be in what's called a parallel circuit. So the electrical current splits at part of the circuit and flows in between them. So we only actually need one wire connected to the positive part of the battery with the way we're building the circuit. So I'm going to then use this jumper wire to connect the same breadboard row as this button and the long wire connected to the other breadboard, this jumper wire now connects the rows of both of these buttons on their internal pins. What we're going to do next is cut two more long wires. We do need two separate wires, one for each motor to control them with the buttons even though this power wire is shared. I'm going to repeat this process again, make two long wires with solid core jumper wire at the end, and then we're going to use those to connect the buttons back to the motors on the breadboard. So we have two more long wires, again a long piece of stranded wire with a piece of solid core wire twisted to and then electrical taped at the end. And we're going to use these wires to connect our buttons to our motors over on this breadboard. So I'm going to push one end of this wire into the outer pin of this button, same row on the breadboard. And then I'm going to put the other end in a blank row over here on this breadboard. And I'm going to use that one to connect to the other wire from this motor. So I'm going to put that in the same row as the end of my long wire. Now, when I push the blue button here, which I've made both connections to, this motor should spin. Okay, you see the other wire is not spinning yet because I have not fully connect, sorry, the other motor 
is not spinning yet because I have not completed my connection to the yellow button. So I'm going to get my other wire. And as a side note, people always ask if the wire color matters. The answer is technically no. It's just the color of the insulation on the outside of the wire. All the wires behave the same, but sometimes using different color wires does make color coding and keeping track of your circuit a little easier. So if you plan on doing more electronics projects in the future, it could certainly be worth it to buy multiple colors of wire. If you just want to buy one spool, you can probably get away with doing this project just with one spool. So again, I'm going to put one end of this wire in the same row as the outer pin of that yellow button. I'm going to put my other row in a my other wire in a blank row on the breadboard and then put the final wire from the motor in the same row as that wire. And now if I push the yellow button, this motor should spin. Uh-oh. So it looks like that motor is not spinning, which probably means I have a mistake in my circuit somewhere. So this can happen where you have a wire pop out of the breadboard, which is one of the advantages of soldering. So the advantage of using a breadboard is that if you make a mistake, it's very easy to correct. You can just move the part around and fix your mistake, whereas soldering, that is a little harder to undo. The problem with a breadboard, as you can see here, is that the wires do pop out much more easily as you are moving things around. So you can see the neither motor is working now because my battery pack wire actually popped out. So if my battery is not connected, nothing's going to work at all. So I'm going to reconnect my battery there, and now we should see that both of my motors are working. Where again, if I just press one button at a time, it's only going to spin one of the motors. If I hold both buttons down, it's going to spin both motors, and that's what's going to allow my robot to drive forward. So again, I know this got a little messy, and it's probably hard to see exactly what is going on here on the breadboards in this video. You can click through to the written instructions for the project in the description, which will show a breadboard diagram. I'm also going to throw that diagram up on screen here for a second, so if you want, you can just pause the video here and refer to this wiring diagram instead of trying to follow what you saw on camera. Or, don't worry if you don't understand these symbols, but if you prefer to work with circuit diagrams, you can see the diagram here. The circuit consists of two parallel branches. Each branch consists of a button in series with a motor. So, now that we have our circuit working, let's talk about building the body of the robot. Again, I am going to show a very simple option in this video, just using a flat piece of cardboard, but you can get more creative and use different craft supplies as well. So, what you will want to do is mount the battery pack and the breadboard on top of the robot and mount the two motors to the bottom of the robot. Where exactly you put everything is up to you. Just make sure that these little white spokes on the motors are sticking out to the sides of the cardboard because you will be pressing the wheels onto them later. So, for example, I am going to set mine up like this where the two motors are going to be under the front edges of the cardboard and then the battery pack and the breadboard are connected like this. You can connect them using a hot glue gun or double-sided tape or really any other adhesive you have available. Just make sure everything is dry and secure before you continue and start trying to drive the robot around. So here we go. I have glued everything in place and I'm going to push my buttons to make sure both my motors still spin. I didn't knock any wires loose during that process. Next, I'm going to pop the wheels onto the motors. So these are just press fit. There's no screws or any other connections you need to make. They just snap on there and are held in place by friction. I'm going to pop my wheels on. Let's make sure you get everything lined up. It's not a circular shaft, so you do have to get the rectangular shape of the shaft lined up with the hole in the motor. There we go. And now I should push the buttons and my robot should drive around. Whoops. The robot is going backwards. I intended it to go forward with this being the front of the robot. Luckily, that is not a big deal. If one or both motors are spinning backwards, all you need to do to reverse the direction that the motor spins is swap the red and black wires for that motor. So I'm just going to take this motor's wires out, swap their location in the breadboard, and this is what I mentioned about the color of the wires doesn't actually matter. It doesn't matter that I have the red wire of the motor going to the black wire of this battery pack. That's not going to damage anything. All that is going to do is reverse that the direction that current flows through the motor and reverse the direction that the motor spins. So now I have switched both of my motor wires around, but apparently I knocked something loose. Let's find out. Yep, I knocked that battery pack wire loose again. I'm gonna put that back in. And now my both of my motors spin forward. 
And when I put the robot down in there, I just knocked a button loose. Again, this is the disadvantage of using a solderless breadboard. We'll talk about that more in a second. There we go. Now, if I hold both my buttons down, my robot drives forward. So I had mentioned the toilet paper tube earlier. This is where that comes in. If you would like your robot to be level or flat, you see right now this robot is tilted and it sort of just drags its butt around on the ground. You can cut this to be a little shorter and glue or tape it in place to prop up the back end of the robot. That way it'll just drag this around and glide easily, especially if you were on a smooth surface like a wood floor. But that's a design choice, you don't have to do that. You could also use something else, like put another wheel back here that isn't attached to a motor and just rolls because it gets dragged along by the other two motors. You could just leave your robot like this and let it drag, or you could attach something else as a slider in the back here. It's really up to you. So now let's talk a bit more about the mess of wires I've created here and how you can make that a little more manageable. You've probably noticed that multiple times throughout the video, I have knocked either a wire or a button loose, which will then prevent the circuit from working. And while this approach is more accessible, since most students aren't going to have access to a soldering iron, it's a little less reliable if those wires get yanked out easily compared to this approach where these parts are soldered permanently onto this perf board and these are in there pretty firmly even if I yank on them. So in this case, tape and glue are your friends. So what you will want to do is use tape or glue to create more firm attachment points to the body of your robot so if you pull on a wire, it doesn't just get yanked directly out of the breadboard. So I'm going to bundle these three wires together and put down a big piece of tape, holding them down across the back of the robot like this. Now, when the remote gets pulled on, it's pulling on this contact point where the tape is holding onto the wires. It's not pulling directly onto the breadboard. So now I can pull those and they don't get yanked out. I can also do the same thing on the remote side of this, I have these three wires. So for example, I could sort of bend them around like this. And see, I just knocked an another button out there again, tape them on to the bottom of the breadboard. So when I yank on the remote, they don't get yanked out of the breadboard for the remote. Now things that are in the breadboard are a little harder to deal with. You can't exactly tape over the button or it would then be harder to push the button or impossible to push the button. But you can use some dabs of hot glue once you have things in place to hold things down on the breadboard. That sort of defe defeats the purpose of a breadboard being highly reusable. You don't necessarily want to gunk it up with glue if you would like to use it in a future project, but you will be able to peel the glue off if you really need to. So if you're having a lot of trouble with buttons or individual wires popping out, you can put them in the breadboard and then apply some glue to help hold them in place. The other thing you can do to help with this mess of three wires going between the robot and the remote is to bundle these together, either by braiding them or using pieces of tape to wrap them together every few inches or so. So for example, I'm going to pull these so they're straight to get rid of the loops, and then I'm going to apply a little piece of tape here to connect them, and I'm gonna do that maybe every six inches or every foot or so along the length of the wire just to prevent them from getting all tangled like this because this is a little nuts. So here I have cleaned everything up, used some tape and glue to secure these wires to the robot, used tape to bundle these wires together so they don't get all tangled, and used some glue to hold the buttons down on the breadboard so they're not falling out all the time. Now I can, again, drive my robot by pushing one button at a time to make it turn, and pushing both buttons to make it drive forward. Finally, you might want to add some decorations. Just make sure they don't interfere with the spinning wheels. As you can see, my daughter decided to help me decorate this one and decided that the robot needed a necklace. For written instructions for this project, many other robotics projects, and thousands of other fun, hands-on science and engineering projects, visit us online at www.sciencebuddies.org.